J.R.R. Tolkien built a world. He didn't just write stories, he crafted languages, histories and mythologies. His Middle-earth, home to hobbits, elves and dwarves, feels real. It resonates with readers because it draws upon very real inspirations. Tolkien was a devout Catholic. His faith permeated his work, even if not always overtly. Alongside his Christian beliefs, Tolkien was deeply familiar with ancient texts. He drew inspiration from the Bible, as well as apocryphal works like the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees. These influences weren't mere window dressing. They were woven into the very fabric of Middle-earth, shaping its characters, themes and grand narratives. Understanding these connections adds a profound layer to Tolkien's already rich tapestry. It allows us to appreciate the depth and complexity he imbued into his world. This essay will explore the hidden inspirations behind Middle-earth, revealing how Tolkien used ancient texts to build a modern mythology that continues to captivate readers generations later. The influence of the Bible on Tolkien's work is impossible to miss. Themes of good versus evil, temptation and redemption echo throughout Middle-earth. The creation story in The Silmarillion, with the valor, angelic beings shaping the world, mirrors the Genesis account. The two trees of Valinor, which brought light and life to the world, recall the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. Their destruction by the Dark Lord Morgoth and his monstrous spider Ungoliant parallels the fall of man. The temptation of the One Ring and its corrupting influence on those who possess it also mirrors the serpent's temptation of Adam and Eve. Just as the Garden of Eden was a paradise lost, so too is there a sense of longing for a lost era of peace and beauty in Middle-earth. The elves, in particular, embody this yearning, often speaking of a time when the world was young and unspoiled. This sense of loss, of a world marred by sin and darkness, is a powerful theme in both the Bible and Tolkien's work. While the Bible's influence is clear, Tolkien also drew inspiration from less well-known texts, such as the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees. These apocryphal works offer a different perspective on biblical stories, expanding on the roles of angels and demons. The Book of Enoch, in particular, fascinated Tolkien. It describes a world populated by different classes of angels, some of whom rebel against God and are cast down to earth. This idea of fallen angels finds its way into Tolkien's work with the Vala, who are tempted and corrupted by Morgoth. The Balrogs, fiery demons who serve Morgoth, also bear a striking resemblance to the Watchers, fallen angels who mate with human women in the Book of Enoch. These apocryphal texts provided Tolkien with a rich source of inspiration for his own mythology, allowing him to create a complex and nuanced cosmology. Welcome, family, to another edition of Stranger Thinking Media. This is Yeshayahu, where we address the problems of the modern world. So stay tuned. We have an awesome show for you today. For you Lord of the Rings lovers, you Tolkien fans, uh, we're going to talk about uh, his writings and where he got his inspiration. Lord of the Rings, unveiling the hidden biblical inspirations, parallel worlds. Topics covered, the Silmarillion and the Apocrypha of Morgoth and Azazel's descent into darkness, corruption and temptations, imprisonment and lasting influence from Nephilim to Orcs, enduring tales of creation and corruption. Welcome to our channel. Please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And most importantly, enjoy the show. Psalm 22, verse 6. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn, they shoot up the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted in Yahuwah that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. The Dawn of Creation, The Silmarillion and the Apocrypha. The Silmarillion by J.R.R. Tolkien and the Book of Enoch, a text considered apocryphal by many, both offer compelling accounts of creation and the origins of evil. Tolkien weaves a rich tapestry of mythology in The Silmarillion, depicting the creation of Middle-earth and the rise of the Valor, angelic beings who shape the world. Similarly, the Book of Enoch expands upon the Genesis narrative, introducing the Watchers, angels tasked 
with observing humanity. Both narratives set the stage for the emergence of darkness and the fall of powerful beings. These stories provide a framework for understanding the nature of good and evil. They explore themes of free will, temptation, and the consequences of disobedience. While the Silmarillion is a work of fantasy literature and the Book of Enoch belongs to religious tradition, they share remarkable similarities in their portrayal of fallen angels and their impact on creation. I was once Melkor, the most powerful of the Valar, but pride and a lust for dominion consumed me. My rebellion against the other Valar and my desire to create life independent of Eru Iluvatar marked my descent into darkness. I, Azazel, a prominent Watcher, fell from grace by sharing forbidden knowledge with humanity and leading other angels astray. Both Morgoth and Azazel begin as beings of immense power and potential. However, their ambition and thirst for knowledge lead them down a path of corruption. Their actions have catastrophic consequences for the world and its inhabitants. Morgoth's discord disrupts the harmony of Arda while Azazel's actions bring about the wrath of God and usher in an era of sin and wickedness. Morgoth's corruption extends to the very fabric of Middle-earth. He infuses his essence into the world, marring its beauty and introducing discord. He seduces elves to his service, twisting them into orcs, and creates monstrous creatures to serve his will. Azazel too corrupts the natural order. He teaches humans the arts of warfare and violence, leading to widespread bloodshed. The actions of both Morgoth and Azazel demonstrate the seductive and corrosive nature of evil. Their influence spreads like a disease, warping the natural world and corrupting the hearts of those they encounter. They exploit the vulnerabilities of others, tempting them with promises of power and knowledge, ultimately leading them astray. Despite their power, both Morgoth and Azazel face consequences for their actions. Morgoth is defeated in a cataclysmic battle and cast into the void, while Azazel is bound and imprisoned beneath the earth. However, their influence continues to be felt long after their imprisonment. Morgoth's spirit lingers, corrupting the hearts of men and elves through his lieutenant Sauron. Azazel's teachings continue to spread through his disciple Gadriel, who teaches humanity the secrets of magic and sorcery. This enduring influence highlights the insidious nature of evil and its ability to persist even after its source has been contained. While both Morgoth and Azazel are eventually subdued, their legacies of corruption and temptation continue to plague the world. One of the most striking parallels between the Silmarillion and the Book of Enoch lies in the creation of monstrous beings. Morgoth, in his desire to dominate creation, breeds a menagerie of grotesque creatures including dragons, balrogs and orcs. These creatures embody the perversion of nature inherent in Morgoth's evil. Similarly, the Book of Enoch describes the birth of the Nephilim. These giant offspring of the Watchers and human women are depicted as monstrous and destructive, embodying the unholy union of the divine and the mortal. The creation of such abominations serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of transgression and the perversion of the natural order that arises from defying divine law. The Silmarillion and the Book of Enoch, though separated by genre and time, offer profound reflections on the nature of good and evil, creation and corruption. They remind us that even in the face of overwhelming darkness, hope and resilience endure. The stories of Morgoth and Azazel serve as cautionary tales, urging vigilance against the seductive nature of power and the importance of remaining true to one's moral compass. These tales offer a glimpse into the enduring human fascination with the origins of the world and the forces that shape our destiny. They remind us that the battle between good and evil is an ongoing struggle, one that plays out not only on a cosmic scale, but also within the hearts of individuals. The Lord of the Rings, also known as Loder by J.R.R. Tolkien, is celebrated as a masterpiece in the fantasy novel genre. In his works, he seemingly creates a world unto, himself, unto itself, complete with gods, angelic beings, uh, fallen ones, mankind, and a host of other creatures. This world he creates even has its own Genesis story, as outlined in the novel The Silmarillion, which I read when I was a very young man. But does this world spring out from Tolkien's imagination alone, or did he receive inspiration from somewhere else? If you look closely, 
you can see the fingerprints of the Bible, the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, and other apocryphal writings throughout the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. In the Silmarillion, you can clearly see the influence of the story of Genesis in apocryphal works. Also, you can compare the fallen gods, Valar, and their leader, Morgoth, with the Book of Enoch and the fallen angels called Watchers. The fallen god, Morgoth, uh, Silmarillion, most corresponds to the Watcher known as Azazel, Azazel, or how, however you want to say it, uh, in the Book of Enoch. Just as Morgoth led creation astray through war and discord, so did Azazel. Both entities were defeated, put in chains, and cast into prison. So, I don't know if you, uh, you might want to check out the books uh, of the apocryphal writings. If you love Lord of the Rings, you'll see where he gets this from. Morgoth and Azazel have lieutenants that continue the works of their masters after their imprisonment. See, this story parallels nicely. Mor Morgoth's lieutenant is Sauron, and Azazel's lieutenant is Gadrel. In the Hebrew scriptures, the fallen angels procreate with human women and produce monsters, abominations called Nephilim. In Tolkien's law, Morgoth and his followers create Balrogs, trolls, goblins, orcs, and other abominations in an attempt to create a world or kingdom of their own where evil would not only survive, but thrive. So I just wanted you to see how great writers, they all seem to fall back to the foundation, to the functional beginning of the script of, of, of Western culture, if you will, the scriptures. So I wish people would uh, look at the scriptures and understand everything you, you believe to be right and wrong. Your moral compass is all based on the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. We didn't just make rules up. Uh, I did a video way back um, where I had, it was Jordan Peterson was talking about, uh, he was one of them talking about if we, he was talking about Nietzsche, if we were to take God out of the picture, you know, Nietzsche famously said, God is dead. Well, if you take God out the picture, then what is your moral uh, standard? What is your moral foundation? You think you know, but what you do know all comes from the Hebrew scriptures, whether you know it or not. So now, without the Hebrew scriptures, try defining right and wrong. I mean, because there's some things that we know is is wrong subconsciously, but if you took away the scriptures, what actually makes that wrong? What makes Machiavellianism wrong? Well, I, I tell you what makes it wrong. It's the scriptures. So whether you deny the scriptures or not, that is your subconscious foundation for morality. And we should not take that lightly. <laughs> Job chapter 1 and verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Ashatan came also among them. And Yahweh said unto Ashatan, Whence comest thou? Then Ashatan answered Yahweh and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Well, that'll do it for this video. I love you all so much. Thank you so much for continually supporting my content. If you did enjoy this video, hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell. And share this with your friends and family. I'm sure they'd find it interesting as well. I'm very excited to continue this journey with you. I thank you all for bringing certain stories to my attention and for continually keeping me updated with certain events around the world. So we're not just, you know, not just a, if you want to call it, religious station. We talk about current events in the light of biblical prophecy, prophecy being fulfilled. So I appreciate you all so much, and a special shout out to the channel members, and may everybody have a beautiful and blessed day, who's in the body of Messiah, Yahusha, Hamashiach, and I'll see you in the next video, Shalom.